Good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing Eric Arnold. Uh, Eric is a network pen tester for a consultancy firm after spending a, a number of years in network support as an operations e engineer. And is to talk today to have her take this one neat trip exploring Crisco Smart Install. Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming out today. So yeah, we're talking about one neat trick that routers hate, uh, and that one trick is Cisco Smart Install. So a little bit about me. Um, I go by Brute Hacker on Twitter. Um, I've been a senior consultant at Portivity for about 18 months, working in the attack and pen area. Uh, I do network pen testing, social engineering engagements. I also do physical security engagements. Um, but before that, I was a network engineer, network support and operations. Um, and I did that for about 10 years in various forms uh, for a logistics firm. And uh, I am proud to have an expired CCNA. Those Cisco tests are really hard. So if you have a bunch of Cisco certs, more power to you. Um, and I wanted to take a little bit of time while I have a platform here to give uh, shout outs to our local meetups here. Uh, Obviously, you're here at B-Sides DFW. Uh, this was the first uh, local hacking um, anything that I came to. I got to see Philip Wiley talk about the pen testing blueprint. Uh, really inspired me to make the move from networking into pen testing. Uh, from there, I met a lot of people, um, including the people from Hack Fort Worth, where I um, like to go monthly as often as possible. I don't live in Fort Worth anymore, but I still try and make it over there as often as possible. Um, also, Dallas Hackers Association, um, which is a, a, a different meetup over on the Dallas side, as well as DC214 and 2600 Fort Worth. Um, I really want to stress that the community is really important, and I think that it has a lot to do with why I'm employed right now. Like, uh, anybody in the audience, raise your hand if you got a, a job through the community. So not a lot, but uh, I think it's still really important and you go and meet a lot of people and I've met some of the smartest people I've ever met at these meetups for sure. Uh, so just an overview of the presentation, what we're going to talk about. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to kind of lead you in on networking a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about network layouts and router features, uh, some of the old ways that we had to uh, configure network equipment before deploying it, and then the, the new ways as well. Um, and then we'll get into the Cisco Smart Install vulnerability and uh, what kind of things uh, happen with it in the wild, uh, who's using it, how long has it been around, um, then we'll also talk a little bit about business impact. So just from the most basic that you can get, what you know, what's a router, what's a switch? Well, they can do transmit and receive uh, data packets so that all of your devices can stay connected to a network or a domain. Um, they can hand out DHCP addresses. They can hold VPN configurations. Um, you know, you can do segmenting of your network in VLANs so that only certain um, devices can talk on certain IP spaces. And you, you know, don't you want to segment your network as as much as possible so that you reduce your attack surface. Um, in addition to that, they also do access control, um, such as port security, where you have to have a certain MAC address to be connected to a certain port um, or an access list where you can essentially do like packet level filtering a la firewall. So this is kind of the old way of doing things, uh, the, the ancient magics of network engineering. Uh, kind of had to get a, a, a putty session with a USB dongle to a serial connector, and then I get a serial connector to an RJ5, RJ45 rollover cable, plug that into that little blue port on the Cisco switch, uh, and then you have a serial connection. You uh, have the right driver. And you better have the right driver for both of those little cords yep. uh, and your, your serial driver on your, on your host as well. Um, and so the, the thing you would have to do is you'd have to take your configuration, which is basically just a big text file, you take your configuration, you paste it in a few lines at a time, really hope you didn't miss one in there or else your access controls aren't turned on at all. Or you, uh, you know, like me, I've done this a hundred times, I promise, uh, forget to turn on SSH and then you give your switch to someone who's taking it out into the tundra and they get out there and you're like, well, I can ping it, but I can't manage it. 
the new way of doing things is a lot cooler. Um, you can make configuration changes at scale using all of these. Um, you can make Python scripts with uh, Paramico and NetMiko libraries. Um, the older scripting languages like Perl and Bash and Expect are all still viable ways of making configuration changes. Uh, at scale, they get to be a little cumbersome, um, and then you have to also think about like secure coding practices, which network engineers not not really uh, on on the list of things that you learn. Uh, other things that can do these sorts of things I don't have as much experience with um, include like Ansible and Puppet. Um, Ansible uh, basically functions with um, like playbooks and YAML files where you build out your entire inventory into YAML and JSON nonsense. I'm just way over my head. Uh, but I know that you have to build out a whole lot of files to be able to get to the point where you're managing a large scale network with those protocols. Uh, also, Chef, I hear is something that people use for network management, um, but I have no experience with that at all. Uh, the one that I've bolded and italicized and highlighted there is uh, SNMP. Um, so that is what a lot of organizations use to manage networks uh, at scale. Uh, what is SNMP? Uh, it's a protocol. It's a supposedly simple network management protocol. Uh, essentially, you have a, you know, a, a read-write string that can set parameters on devices. Um, the monitored devices can send SNMP traps back to a centralized location so that you can see, like, hey, uh, my port went down. Here's an SNMP trap, and then your management protocol or system knows about it and you can kind of take action as the knock or as the sock or whoever. Um, but it does that via get and set requests. So another thing that we kind of need to go over before we really get into it is Cisco configurations. So what are what's in the config itself? Um, port information is in there, the IP addresses, the MAC addresses, your port security, if you're gonna lock it down to a particular uh, MAC address, that's in there. Uh, your routing tables, how one network gets to another network and via what devices. Um, if you're sending all your stuff to a firewall or a web filter, like those kinds of rules, make it into router configs. Um, in addition, topographical information, like um, kind of just what I was saying, where you're separating two geographic locations by IP space. Um, you want routing rules in there so that your Atlanta office can talk to your Los Angeles office. Um, in addition to those things, access lists, I only want to be able to speak to Atlanta from Atlanta, um, that sort of thing, and the IP uh, down to the port level as well. Uh, so like a firewall, but more packet filtering than, uh, than like deep packet inspection. Also in there are login usernames and passwords, which are encrypted, um, but uh, as we'll go into in a little bit, there are some Good, in, uh, good encryption standards and uh, really bad ones that are instant uh, decrypt. In addition to those, um, you can have FTP or TFTP servers that are hard coded into your router configs so that um, you know potentially you're sending back your router configs to a centralized FTP server, something along those lines. Um, in addition to that are radius keys. I haven't had a lot of success on the job with um, you know, poisoning radius servers or anything, but basically radius is a protocol which will let you uh, authenticate to a router, uh, but it, it sends it back to a steel belted radius server so to do the actual uh, like authorization. Um, in addition to that, you have SNMP community strings in there. So like we were saying, like SNMP works by sending messages um, to devices within your network that speak SNMP. Uh, these messages are GET requests, but they also need this community string in there to be authorized to either read and pull the information or make actual changes to the config. Uh, so one of the cool tools that I found out there uh, in regards to Cisco configs, if you have a Cisco config or maybe you found one um, in a pen test, this tool, uh, CCAT, Cisco CAT, uh, is a nice analysis tool, it'll kind of dump passwords out of there, still encrypted, but it'll dump the passwords out of there, it'll give you like topographical information and uh, kind of map the network for you, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a really nice tool. Um, I've found some use for it in, in my professional work. 
Back to SNMP. More SNMP. I should have called this talk SNMP something or other, but it's more on SNMP than Cisco Smart Install for the most part. Uh, so we've got three different versions of SNMP. So the default version of SNMP that was created in the 80s is SNMP v1. That's clear text. It supports low-level security, sends data in the clear, no encryption. Um, you know, it was supporting 32-bit counters. So that there's a limit to the kind of data that you can get back from it. Um, V2, uh, created in the 90s, uh, was a revision on V1, and it improved performance and uh, a little bit in security, but there's still no encryption here. There's some MD5 uh, community string hashing that can be uh, configured, but no one does. Um, it also introduced a few different ways of getting larger packets back from uh, like, a, like a get bulk request from the SNMP uh, device. Um, but it still operates with community strings, which are for the most part plain text in your config. So that's something to think about. Um, SNMP is the newest version. I believe it was also developed in the 90s, so it's still it's kind of moldy at this point, but nobody is using it. I put in there when I initially made this presentation that I'd never seen it in 10 years of networking, but I saw it on an engagement this week, and it made my week horrible. I couldn't figure out how to get around. Like I, I was like, I have so much experience messing with SNMP v2c, and as soon as I ran into v3, I'm like, I, my playbook is like not really fleshed out for this three stuff. The SNMP community strings, I would like to think of them like uh, passwords. Um, you have to have a certain string to authenticate with the SNMP device for it to say like, oh, you want to you want a get? I'll give you some config if you have a read-only string. But if you want to set anything on my SNMP config, you need my read-write string. And something of note is that um, these are scanned for by Nessus. And I've seen a lot of testers see the Nessus results and they're like, oh, it's a 7.5, like throw it out, nothing I can do with that. But um, there is a whole lot that you can do with SNMP as I will repeatedly drill into your brains. So, you know, why use it basically? Well, it, it sends this trap, it says my port is down to an SNMP server or like a network management um, platform. Uh, and then you can build out logic to have any one of those traps trigger some kind of alert, maybe it's a script, maybe it's just the knock investigating uh, or sending an email, whatever. Um, but SNMP can also be used to send back full router configs so that you can uh, keep them in a CMDB or you know, more likely some server under a nerd's desk. But um, also you can do it, uh, use it for network management using the tools that I put up on the screen there, SNMP walk, and then SNMP get and set are the uh, tools that you can use to like send the SNMP um, queries to any given device. Uh, network monitoring platforms a lot of times use SNMP to like do automated stuff. If you wanna uh, run a check every day for a certain config line, that's a lot of times done with SNMP. Um, and I'll, I put a note in here that there's also a lot of non-Cisco usages for this. Um, SNMP is uh, not a, a Cisco-specific protocol. Uh, it's used on basically every endpoint that's on your network. Um, you know, Mac, Windows, and Linux alike all like to use SNMP. You know, there's some configuration there. Uh, that's a little bit out of scope. And I uh, just wanted to note that there are a lot of things that you can do with SNMP that are non-Cisco, like getting uh, disk utilization or like CPU utilization and then a lot of other things depending on the vendor of the of the product and um, you know what kind of information you have configured to be monitored by SNMP. So how do we secure SNMP? Uh, there are a few different ways. Um, these are the Cisco and the CISA guidelines and they tend to kind of match up a little bit. I'm seeing some trends here use a good community string. I saw a lot of guidance that was like, treat them like passwords, put numbers in them, make them really long, make them hard to crack, uh, because then that would just slow down anybody who's trying to mess with SNMP on your network. Um, another thing that you can use with SNMP are called SNMP views, which is basically like whitelisting for configuration commands. Uh, so both organizations advise that you use SNMP views and you make sure that they don't let you reload a switch via SNMP or things like that. 
Um, the recommendation is also to use SNMP v3, use the highest level of security. But like I said, it is very rare for me to see SNMP v3 out in the wild. SNMP v2 is very prevalent. Um, and uh, the, the only CISA said patch your system, so I guess you don't have to if you listen to Cisco. Here are some of the ways that you can use SNMP walk and set. Um, this is just kind of an example. This starts to get a little chunky, and I decided not to talk about MIBs in this talk because I figure half the room's asleep by this point anyway. Uh, but these numbers that are prepend all of these like string values, those are SNMP MIBs where um, if you want to interact with SNMP, you have to go and find the particular MIB for the configuration option that you want. So uh, the one down here is, uh, you know, I, I think it's the uh, operating system SNMP MIB. So this one is this VIOS at first. And then they send an SNMP set uh, with a public community string uh, to that IP address, attaching the MIB and setting it to the word hacked. And that's kind of how you can change can, uh, SNMP configuration options. Now, that's just one that you could kind of uh, demonstrate without impacting the, uh, impacting the switch itself. But um, there are a lot more malicious options out there. So talking about encryption types uh, for passwords that are in your configs, um, the DHS releases best practices for Cisco passwords. So I recommend that you, if you are a network engineer or an architect or somebody, to go out and check with DHS to see what they're saying and make sure that you're not using an encryption type that is way more crackable than you think it is. Um, the examples here, the, the, the first table is straight out of the DHS document. So they're saying type 0, 4, and 7, just don't use them at all. Uh, and you'll see a little bit later, like they are instant decrypt. Um, it's like not even, you don't have to throw GPU power at it or anything. Um, and on the table below, there was a, a blog by InfoSec Matter where they mapped out uh, hashing or cracking speeds of, of each of these encryption types. Um, and you can see like they don't even have like a, a, a speed for the type 0 and 7. They're just like instant. I mean, you can, what we did a lot of times um, was go to, there's a website that will decrypt 0 and 7 passwords. And sometimes when you're looking at configs, like, what is that? And you throw it in that site and it's like, oh, it's type 7. Got it. Because it decrypt in instantly. So the type 8 you can see is the, uh, you know, a really hard hash type to use. Um, the type nine is not NIST approved, but it's the lowest uh, number of attempts per second. So I, I anticipate that'll make it um, into the standards at some point here. Uh, here's what they look like in a config uh, with different hash types. You can see there's like a, a privilege option there, and 15, uh, privilege 15 for Cisco is basically root. You can do whatever you want with privilege 15. It's kind of a weird system and not worth talking about, but just know 15 is root. Um, these other ones you can see are things like username, admin, secret uh, is just the Cisco config option. It's like your secret password. Um, and then they have it hashed in, in plain text. On the bottom are community strings. Uh, these are the options that you're looking for if you're looking for community strings. The RO and RW are for read only and read write. So if you find yourself an RW string, you're in business. Uh, so you can, you know, if you're looking for configs, uh, you can find them on an FTP share sometimes on the client network or on your own network. Uh, maybe it's on some user's share. Maybe a network engineer has an open share. Uh, so that he can more, they, they can more effectively uh, manage you, their router configs, or that they can, you know, do analysis on them at scale and say, like, oh, how many instances of this particular command uh, do I have out there in, the, in my giant 5,000 node network? Um, maybe if you could get them from the router itself somehow, that would be great. So we'll move into Cisco Smart Install now. F finally, you know, um, so the network engineer ancient magics were awful. Uh, plugging in, a, you know, the serial cable to the router itself and dumping the config in line by line—that sucks. Uh, so 
what we like is zero touch provisioning. That is pretty cool. Uh, if you have a blank switch and you connect it to a network that has ZTP configured on it, uh, it'll suck down a config and an iOS and everything and kind of configure itself uh, based on your standards. So that's really nice. Uh, use cases for that are, uh, you know, you're, you're sending someone a, a router, but they have to travel out way far out somewhere else and they're just gonna plug it in and they might not really know what a computer does. Uh, so it's going to be really hard to get them to, you know, screen share with you and help you paste in their, your configurations and everything. Or uh, the other reason that you would use ZTP is if you have a whole lot of switches that you're trying to deploy. You've racked up 200 switches in a data center uh, and you're the only one uh, managing them. So if you have ZTP enabled, you can kind of just get them all plugged in and they'll all get configured up and you don't have to do as much management. That's really nice. So one of the things uh, that's important to note is that uh, Cisco devices need patched all the time. You always are updating iOS. Cisco says you release a new version and it's like, all right, there's 7,000 devices again, here we go. Upload a new iOS device, you gotta reboot it. Every time that you update, I hope they come back uh, because you don't wanna make that drive. <laughs> uh, so also, things that it can do or is capable of is uploading new configuration files and executing CLI commands. That's really nice at scale, I'm telling you. Um, maybe copying uh, your files back to a TFTP server or something, but the problem with it is that it's vulnerable. Uh, these are the two relevant CVEs for this exploit, and there's a lot of boring language in here about uh, improper validation of packet data, um, but at the end of the day, um, Cisco built this uh, protocol without authentication in line. So people were able to reverse engineer the packet and you know, send something crafted to that port 4786, which is the port that it runs on, um, and make config changes to it or upload a, a new iOS device or something. Like uh, the arbitrary code on the device is the, the relevant line in, in all this word soup. Uh, and now a word from Cisco, our sponsor. Cisco Smart Install is a plug and play configuration and image management feature that provides zero touch deployment. Any of you people using this are misusing the protocol. It's not really a vulnerability or an exploit, even though we have two CVEs for it. So how do you scan it and detect it? or exploit it rather, uh, you want to detect vulnerable instances, a pretty easy way is in map on port 4786. Not a whole lot of other things using that port. Um, and it's, it's a pretty good bet that that, um, that that port being open means that Cisco Smart Connect is running on it. However, it will return a banner that says Cisco Smart Install Client Installed. Um, Cisco Talos uh, did release a tool called uh, SMI Check, which is a better validation way. It'll actually kind of communicate with the protocol a little bit more. In addition to this, there's an MMAP script uh, that I didn't include on this slide. There's an NSC script by uh, the people who made uh, SIET. Um, there's also a Nessus plugin and probably other, other vulnerability scanners, but uh, you know, I, I only have as much experience with, uh, with Nessus, so I've seen it in Nessus quite a few times. Uh, if you have access to the command line of a router, you're a, you're a network engineer, you want to see, or, or an admin, and you want to see if uh, Smart Install is running uh, on your devices, you can do that show TTP brief all. And, uh, you know, the pipe I, which is basically a grep uh, for 4786, so it'll tell you if that port is listening. Uh, you can also do the show vstack config. Um, and again, grep for that role, it'll say like client or director. For exploitation, there are two main um, frameworks here. Uh, one is the SIET Pi. Um, this was made by the original researchers and released the Smart Install Exploitation Toolkit. And then a year, year and a half later, there's also a Metasploit module, which is graded in its own, in its own way. So this talks a little bit about um, the exploitation toolkit itself. So these are the two researchers. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce their names, but their research is published there on this uh, zeronights.ru site. Um, they released the exploitation toolkit along with the original research. This is, if you really wanted to get in the weeds of this um, exploit, 
uh, these guys have all the packet level stuff in this presentation. So I don't have any novel research here. It's, I'm, I'm pointing directly at them for that. So the capabilities of this tool are remote code execution. They have a scanner in it. They can upload configs with it. You can upload iOS images with it. Uh, it's got a TFTP server integrated for downloading configs. It's threaded. You can do RCE on multiple devices at once. It's awesome. I mean, it, I can't believe that they released this along with the research and everything. You'd think that it'd be like two or three teams and two or three years working on this kind of stuff to come out with it. Question. So to learn more about this, I need to go to a Russian website hosted by Hacker. <laughs> that's, that's right. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. and download a PDF. That's right. Direct sure, link. Sure the link's legit, guys. I promise. Uh, <laughs> You know, .ru domains are not that expensive. Got another question in the back. Uh, the question was, uh, what if you need to bypass an ACL on the switch? Um, there's, if you have 4786 ACL'd off, you're not getting to it. Uh, so this, this, this exploitation does stop with ACLing it off or firewalling off that kind of thing. That gets into the, the detection. Can you bypass Cisco ACLs? Uh, that sounds like something that's possible uh, that I have not researched, so I can't speak to it myself. Uh, but I'd love to talk to you after the presentation for sure. Oh, true. Yeah. So the the. The comment was uh, to be careful if you're downloading this kind of stuff on your work machine, uh, so that they can't come back and say like, "Hey, you're, you know, you're you're downloading uh, an exploitation toolkit on your work machine." I would recommend for that you might go with the Cisco Talos tool, the SMI check, uh, so, which doesn't have actual exploitation capability. Oh sure, yeah. Now the 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 SIT uh, the exploitation toolkit itself is hosted on GitHub. This is just the research, um, but they released uh, they released the tool itself on GitHub as well. Um, so in 2019, they up updated it to Python 3 and also released an NSE script. So that was very kind of them. Here's an example of this script being run. Uh, they're running it on an entire slash eight, dumping all of the uh, relevant um, IP addresses into a list. And then for all of the ones in the list, they're running the exploitation toolkit on it and gripping out usernames. Um, so you can see some of them are in plain text there. And some of them, you know, you got a lot of zeros and sevens in that list, which is great compared to, uh, you know, because of our last slide. This is what the Metasploit module looks like. Uh, it also runs its own TFTP server. It'll copy down the config for you. It'll let you upload things as well. Um, and a cool thing about this is it will do the decryption in line so that you can see the ones that I've, I've uh, redacted there are um, usernames and passwords that it figured out on its own. Uh, in addition there, we've got it pulling out the SNMP community strings for you. Also nice. So, um, you know, if you're given an inch, I'd like you all to take a mile. Uh, one of the things about this uh, exploit is that a lot of the research stops at the point of exploitation, but I think that a lot of the things that come out of the config are more important than the actual vulnerability. Like, depending on um, the encryption standards that you're using in your configs, the, your community uh, string usage, if you have SNMP v3, um, if you're ACLing stuff off, like all that stuff is really valuable information to an attacker. So you've got some router and switch configs, now what? Well, let's try and decrypt the passwords. Probably got a few that decrypted instantly. Cool, let's try them everywhere. Uh, I'm a pen tester, not a red teamer, so I'm gonna try them everywhere. Uh, if you're able to log into network devices, you can verify your access with something like configuration T uh, for terminal, which is basically like admin mode for a Cisco device. Um, another thing, but don't change anything, please, uh, if, if this is on a client. Um, you can also verify your SNMP community strings with SNMP walk. Um, make sure to use a read write one to display uh, the, the most serious impact. Uh, and remember all the, the hours I had to bore you about community strings uh, to show how important these are to your client or your company. 
Um, also, try and use your new FTP creds. Um, you probably found some in your config. Let's go look at that server, see what's on there. Maybe they've got a few uh, admin management scripts on there that left their network admin password in there. I've seen it before, I'll see it again. Um, also, there's a, a, a field in Cisco configurations to say this was last configured by so and so. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't have any way to gather usernames. Uh, uh, on the rest of the network, but you found yourself a new username and you know that they're at least uh, able to configure routers. So that's probably some some pretty good targeting there. So if you're a red teamer, um, I think that this has real value to help you identify sensitive networks. Um, one of the cool things is that since we have remote code execution, we can do things like adding ourselves a GRE tunnel um, for C2. So you know, consider the implications of that. Um, if you're a state actor, maybe you have the resources to develop custom iOS images. Maybe you can embed C2 in the image bin itself and make it, you know, pass the, the, the hash validation done by Cisco at the hardware level. Um, in addition to that, C2 and XFIL via new GRE tunnel as well. Like it, it's, it's happened before. Um, so how do you get your client or your company to care? Well, um, you need to emphasize all these things that I've talked about with SNMP. Like, uh, you might not be able to demonstrate this kind of value in a really short pen test uh, because a lot of these changes are dangerous. Um, I, I really <laughs> I need to stress, like, if you're messing with read-write on network devices, there's a real possibility that you're going to mess it up. Uh, you know, I think I saw a figure yesterday while I was doing more research that 30% of outages are caused by human error. Um, and that's by, you know, the, the, the trained network people who manage this network every day. If you're making config changes on an unfamiliar network, there's a pretty good chance you're going to break something. So just kind of stress that to your company. Um, if you de Did you decrypt the passwords? Uh, you know, try those creds everywhere. Sometimes that can be like DA uh, in that you have control over all the network devices. That's really valuable. Uh, did you ID any new networks? Uh, you know, maybe you can pivot to another place. Maybe you can add yourself a route to uh, to get to a new network you didn't know about, like a CDE or something like that. Um, do you ID any new accounts to target? And uh, remember that you could do actually actually get these things rebooted into uh, you know new configuration, which is basically just a text file of garbage, uh, and it turns your uh, your router into a five thousand dollar doorstop. So here are a few exploitation scenarios. Um, the first one is that Cisco Smart Install is everywhere. I have it turned on everywhere on every device, externally and internally. Well, that's RCE everywhere, that's bad. Um, you have active risk of, risk of sabotage, active risk of espionage. Um, you know, Regardless of your security controls, this is going around uh, almost all of them. Um, if you only have it on one switch externally, um, you're still at risk of getting your config exposed. I really hope that you're using Radius or TACX uh, or ACLing stuff off or firewalling stuff off. The third scenario is that you only have it on one switch internally, but you have great security controls. That's cool. Uh, well, I hope your SNMP security strings are, are, are good. Um, I hope that you have SNMP v3 and SNMP views configured because otherwise you still have write access to all your network devices. Um, and then the last scenario is that you only have it on one switch and you have really bad security controls. Um, in my opinion, this is as bad as having Cisco smart install everywhere. Um, you're able to decrypt um, an admin password. I've probably got execution on all of your devices anyway. So uh, detection and hardening. Uh, in 2017, there were 215,000 nodes exposed. Um, this is around the time that the initial research came out. Um, when I first started doing research on this in April, uh, we were at about 15,000 nodes. And I checked yesterday, and it was up to nearly 20,000. I don't know why we've gone up. It seems like it should be going down. Uh, but you know, data doesn't lie here. So uh, one of the notes that I had is that 3,000 of them are tagged as honeypots in Shodan. I don't know what the, how that works, but I just wanted to note it. Um, more detection, uh, suspicious logins, suspicious configuration changes. Um, here's some relevant config entries. Um, hardening and best practices. Uh, honestly, turn it off. Uh, there are better ways to manage your network. 
Uh, you use authentication controls, use TACX, use Radius, use MFA to configure your network devices. You'd use the good password encryption. Um, consider changing SNMP strings based on uh, what region of the network you're in. Uh, and then finally, the, the Cisco and the CISA guidelines are to ACL it off. So there's an ACL uh, to have only a certain config hosts be able to access that port at all. Um, only have a couple minutes left, but um, I want to talk about some of the ways that it's been used in the wild. So what, this, this attack by uh, a, a group called JHT um, doorstopped about 3,500 switches in Russia and Iran. Uh, they restored fairly quickly, but uh, you know I, I think we can guess their politics. Uh, there was also um, an APT named Grizzly Step that is alleged to have used this for uh, making GRE tunnels for their XFIL, uh, redirecting DNS, and doing C2 through their G GRE tunnels. Um, there's a long note here about um, the attribution of this. I put, are you state-sponsored question mark. I'm not in threat hunting, and I don't really have any say in threat attribution. So there are a lot of people who have argued about this. And there was also a hacktivist campaign uh, last year in May. Uh, Lumen Technologies released some research that um, showed uh, a hacktivist group doorstopped about 100 routers that were online. Um, they loaded a manifesto into the startup config. I downloaded it. I read it. Uh, I wish I hadn't, but now I know what psychotronic weapons are. Um, Cisco has also alleged that um, the Dragonfly, Crouching Yeti, Energetic Bear group has used this um, situationally in their 2017 campaign, um, but I really couldn't find a whole lot more documentation uh, to support this. Cisco just kind of says their TTPs match uh, this vulnerability. So um, the last thing here is about business impact. Um, how much does downtime cost your org? Will this cause downtime in your org? Um, in 2016, the, the Ponemon Institute said about 500K an hour. Um, which is 618k now, yikes. Uh, the point being that this kind of sabotage needs to be in your DR plan. Um, this is kind of like, has the capability to be the kind of wiper bot that you've seen other malwares take at like Windows systems, but on your network devices. So what happens if someone wipes your whole network and then it wipes your network too, uh, it wipes your network devices too. So you're trying to restore from uh, a cyber incident and you, you know, start plugging into switches and you're like, oh, our switches are down too. Like that makes this so much worse. Um, here's, right. So here's some, uh, some more figures here. Uh, 2015 Apple store outage of 12 hours was $25 million cost. You know, Delta Airlines was down for five hours. That resulted in like 2,000 canceled flights, cost them 150 million. Facebook took 14 hours, uh, turned that into a $90 million eat. Um, so, you know, this is all org base. Uh, every organization is different. Um, downtime can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different companies. So how much is it gonna cost your org uh, for you to put this in your DR plan? At least plan for this kind of stuff. Um, this is destructive and sabotage -y and kind of skiddy, like, but it's a real threat. And it's been used in the wild uh, uh, time after time. Uh, so here's a bunch of memes uh, just to wake you all up uh, after all that. <laughs> These are terrible. That's why I labeled them terrible network memes. Uh, my favorite one is the, it's not the network, it's your application. Because it's not the network. And other than that, I've got time for QA. So any more questions? I know we had some during the presentation. What you got right here? Have you ever knocked down any network equipment? Have, have I ever knocked down any network equipment? <laughs> with the exploit. With the exploit, with, uh, with the exploit. no. <laughs> On the job, yes. Uh, plenty of times. I've made the news in three states. Uh, not, not, for, not for good reasons. <laughs> any other questions? With this exploit, you've knocked you've knocked uh, devices down yeah. by. Uh, were you uploading new configs to them or? Down like when they had pulled the config, the config was there, but then I guess they hadn't rebooted the switch in the router in a while, so it knocked it all down. So everything went down. It just bounced it. So it was basically just right. So the person in the audience said that they have used this uh, exploit and triggered a reload in the device, which is a bad day for. Uh, 
for, you know, convincing them they can do a pen test next year too. Like that's a, that's a bad, that's a resume generating event, right? Like. <laughs> So, so in this scenario, there was uh, no redundancy in the switch, and it brought down everything. That's great. Glad to hear it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? <laughs>